Hello, and welcome to The Right Side. I'm your host, Shane Patrick Connolly. The Right Side takes a look at issues, opinions, and news from a conservative perspective. With us today, we are privileged to have Rob Long, writer, producer, and founder of Ricochet.com. Welcome to you, Rob. No, thanks for having me. Well, uh, let's start by uh, finding out how you got into the business. <laughs> Depends on which business you're talking about. Um, uh, I've been in the entertainment business, show business, for uh, my whole career, for about 30 years. Um, I started, I was a, a film student at UCLA in the uh, master's screenwriting program. And um, that was a long time ago, probably, you know, way before you were born, way, you know, back, I think it was the McKinley administration. <laughs> and, um, and someone told me, uh, hey, you know, the, the real opportunities in television. And so I wrote a couple of TV scripts and joined up with a friend of mine, and we just started, we sent them out, and before we knew it, we were working. We were staff writers on what was then the hit, t the biggest TV show ever called Cheers, which I still have to remind people, it, you know, it was on, because it used to be, I would say to people, I write for Cheers, and they would say, oh, I love that show. And then they, a few years would pass, and they'd say, oh, I used to watch that show with my parents. And now it's like, <laughs> oh, that's my grandparents' favorite show. So uh, I have to, like, you know, Dated. I'm, I'm, I'm a dated character at this point. But then I started doing that, and I just I never stopped. I just loved it so much, and I, I liked comedy and liked writing it and liked writing and producing shows. I had a bunch of shows on and a bunch of shows off after that, and still do it and still love it. So uh, a few people have heard of Cheers, I yeah, believe. Yeah, true. Yeah, thank yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so is there anything more recent that uh, we would recognize? Well, I did this uh, Kevin James show for a couple of years that was on uh, on CBS, and we did our best. We didn't, we didn't make it to the... You know the finish line, but did two two and a half great years. And before that, had a bunch of shows on. Did one with uh, Bob Newhart and Judd Hirsch called um, uh, George and Leo. Did a bunch did a couple shows on the WB network, which was sort of a young person's network. Um, and you know you try. That's the great thing about uh, you know but we're in Silicon Valley right now, so it's sort of like venture capital, right? There's a, you you try a lot of things, and um, the goal is to get one hit. And sometimes your career you have one hit. Sometimes your career you have five hits. Sometimes you have no hits. But the point is, you gotta like you gotta you know you're in there swinging. Well, uh, you've had a very interesting career, and then you started Ricochet.com. Yeah. And that's a web-based business, right? Uh, what what is that like? What do we? Well, Ricochet. I was a co-founder of Ricochet. I started with my friend Peter Robinson, and we started right around the right around the time the, of the Barack Obama's election. And our theory was that first of all, the internet's kind of a swamp. It's kind of nasty. Um, and so we needed a place for people on the center right to get together and be able to have a conversation uh, with some strict rules about conduct and civility. And, you know, we're conservatives, so we figured that the, the way to do that is a, to apply a free market solution to that problem, right? Why do people go on Twitter and on the Internet and just scream obscenities at each other? It's because it's free, because they don't pay anything for that. So if you join a club, which you join, ricochets like two bucks a month or something, um, you get some skin in the game. Like nobody joins a club to scream obscenities in the clubhouse. You, you join because you want to have a meaningful interaction with people around the country, around the world for us, uh, from the center right perspective. So we have a lot of people from the center and a lot of people on the right, a lot of people who love Trump, a lot of people who don't love Trump. Um, and so it becomes a lively, civil, very polite, but very interesting discussion, which I think is the only one of its kind on the web. So Ricochet is center right, conservative perspective, right? Uh, well, how did you become a conservative? Uh, Hollywood's not exactly known as a uh, no. incubator for conservatism. No, no. I, I used to make the joke when I started. I was uh, I started writing in 1990, so I used to make the joke that the good news is well, the bad news is there aren't that many Hollywood conservatives. The good news is that one out of every three of them becomes president of the United States, because that's about <laughs> what it was back then. Well, I think I think I mean I, I'm a generational. I think I'm a generational conservative. Like, there, there are people my age. I mean, I, was, I went to very liberal schools and very liberal university and basically was pretty liberal. Right, UCLA, not exactly a yeah. bastion of conservatism. No, and I, I was a, by then I was a graduate student. I mean, I had come from back east. Um, and I was taught, you know, people forget, but I was taught um, that Reagan was a dangerous lunatic and he was going to blow up the world. And that we we're going to surround ourselves with nuclear weapons, and we are going to be living in a post-nuclear Holocaust world. And if you looked at the popular culture back then, if you look at like the ABC did some giant two-part TV uh, movie called The Day After, 
And if you're old enough, you remember that. If you're you know, young enough, you forget. You don't even know what a TV this movie is a was. Post-apocalyptic kind of tale. What happens and, and how we get to the nuclear uh, uh, holocaust was because of a uh, rabid anti-communism in America, hmm. and 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 its counterpart in Russia. And I was just taught that was the case, and I was taught all the way up until you know a, a one day in 1989 or 88, I was taught that communism and the Soviet Union was just another system. And the people who live under that system are perfectly happy living their lives. And the people who live in our system, we're happy living our lives. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of gross and maybe even a little bit tacky to like talk about how bad communism is. And then, um, then the Berlin Wall came down. And it was all, all the lies were revealed, right? It's not just, it wasn't just that they were happy, they were enslaved in East, East Germany. It wasn't that the people in Russia were happy living under sort of the, the tyranny of communism. They, they were happy when it was over. They, some of them stood in the middle of the street and were shot and killed for mm. freedom. And it turns out Ronald Reagan was right and everybody else was wrong. Everybody else who taught me was wrong. Yeah, so it was quite the opposite of the outcome that they were predicting. Totally. Uh, right. We actually backed away from uh, nuclear annihilation. <laughs> right, peace through strength, right? Reagan was right. And so once you discover that, once you think, okay, well, that was wrong. What else is wrong? And then you start reading, you know, when you read, I read Paul Johnson's uh, Modern Times, and you read, you know, the greats. Some of them live around here. You read, uh, um, um, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, Milton Friedman was a, was a fellow here at Hoover. Uh, Tom Sowell, fellow here at Hoover. You start reading these books, and you start thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe a lot of things were wrong. And then at that point, you think, well, okay, maybe, maybe, the way to freedom, and maybe the way you treat people around the world, and the way your country, the posture of your country around the world, and is the same as the posture of your community at home. Maybe the choice that we have in the marketplace is the right choice for schools and for healthcare, and maybe freeing up consumers to make choices is a good thing. Um, once you do that, it's like it's like now you're down the rabbit hole. You can't come back. Now, that doesn't seem like the trend currently in California. No, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. But no. then again, we have some, and we have some big problems, I mm -hmm. think, uh, uh, from a conservative perspective, we'd say because of it. Uh, right, right. These problems aren't getting solved, and they just keep throwing more money at right. them. Right. Um, what would be uh, something uh, that would be ripe for uh, an application of free market principles today in California? Well, what's interesting about California is California has the history, had, had one of the greatest public school systems in the, in the country, in the world. And now ask yourself this question, right? How many people come to California so they can send their kids to public school? Not many, right? No. How many people come to California so they can send their kids to public university? Lots. Yeah. Why? Public universities, they are, you know, they're funded by the state. They, have, they get taxpayer dollars, but they also, you also compete. They compete for students. They have to show results. That's, we, ex we totally exempt high schools from having to do that. We actually don't even ask them to do that. Well, why shouldn't, you know, why shouldn't we just at least have that level of choice at high school that we have at college? But the, the sort of monopolistic forces fight that. And, you know, that's something that I think conservatives always forget about. Like, uh, school choice is a moral, I think it's a moral issue. We should be talking about it all the time. That's what's going to make the difference between an America that, like, you know, grows and changes and adapts to the future and an America that stays behind, because he has one or two or three or four or five steps behind, um, is education. Around the world, they're getting a better education than we are. That should be, that should make us nervous. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, conservatives often feel they're being attacked, they're under attack, yeah. and uh, you just talked about connecting people uh, with people on values. Um, I was listening to a program on Ricochet, uh, Jonah Goldberg. Yes, The Remnant. And, uh, and yes, and mm -hmm. he, and he, a great show. And he was talking about, uh, he was talking with uh, someone from the American Enterprise Institute mm -hmm. uh, about how we connect on values. And uh, is that something that you would be a proponent of? How do we, how do we communicate conservative yeah. messaging to? Well, I mean, I think we have to decide what we're really trying, what's our, what's our outcome here? And in the past, I think conservatives, or I shouldn't say conservatives, I should say the, the conservative, the party, the political party that represents most conservatives is the Republican Party. And in the past, what it's done is it's used values and um, 
values-based arguments and messages to, as a wedge to divide people. Hmm. Like you're either in, you're out. And that's worked, for the, that's worked a lot because when you get right down to it, a lot of people feel they're a little conservative, right? That's working less and less now. Um, and so we have to come up with another way to do it, another, another goal. And I don't think the goal should be to identify people who are in the in-group or the out-group. Instead, it should be, what do you really care about? If you accept the fact that we're not all going to agree on everything and that I'm not going to agree on how you live your life, you're not going to agree on how I live my life, there's a whole bunch of things that we do that are really not, that are not up for discussion. But how, what kind of country do we want? We want a country where kids go to, co go to school, where every kid can get a good education and learn something about science, right? Because if you don't learn something about science and technology, you're kind of going to be lost. We want a place where if you do have to change your job or if you do have to go somewhere else or if you do get sick, that you're not going to die in the street. That's fair. That's a, that's a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. Those are values. How do you accomplish that? The left says what we do is we get, create a gigantic monopolistic co co corporation, basically, that's union-based, and we say you are now in charge of all education, and if you uh, any criticism of you, you squash, right? And then on healthcare, we say we're going to create this gigantic federal program that's going to set prices and procedures in D.C., and it's all going to have this ripple effect on everything everybody does and what your doctor tells you to do. What conservatives say is um, we're going to let you choose. We're going to assume that you're smart. We're going to assume that you, as a parent, you know, care about your kid's education, so you're going to be attentive to it, and you're going to pick the best school for your kid. We assume that you're going to like you're going to want to stay healthy, so you're going to want to go to the doctor and demand that that doctor be open at eight o'clock at night when you're home, or be open early in the morning before you go to school. What all those things? Like you're going to demand service, because you know consumers, empowered consumers demanding service are incredibly powerful, more powerful than any bureaucrat is ever could ever imagine being, and that's what free market conservatives believe. So uh, what do you think the iPhone would be without free market uh, yeah. principles? Uh, That's what I, it always I freaks me out. You have these people, especially here in Silicon Valley, who, but even kids, like younger people, you know, they have this iPhone. Look, I have my phone in my pocket, right? If I put it here and you touch it, like I get a little freaked out. Like, what, put my phone down, right? You know, like, <laughs> what are you doing? Not because you're going to see anything on it, but because, like, I have it set the way I like it. You know, when you go to the, uh, the Apple store, the guy's got your phone, and he's like, don't change the way I like it. We have this obsession with making sure it's all personalized to us, mm -hmm. and yet wh why is it that the whole generation that demands that kind, that level of specific personalization from a, a $1,000 piece of technology, right, wants to get its health care from the post office? So uh, Elizabeth Warren, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren, was just talking about breaking up some of these uh, right. technology companies. Um, isn't it strange that... She hasn't proposed breaking up big government monopolies. Right. Only private, uh, you know, competitive industries, you could say, because there's, Apple's not the only uh, right. phone producer out there. Oh, absolutely. Apple has enormous competition. For that matter, so does Google, really, when you get right down to it. I mean, you could come up with a better algorithm if you want. I mean, <laughs> the fact that these companies went from, had this enormous amount of growth from zero to whatever they are now, is a sign that the barrier to entry is really just how smart you are and how smart your business is, not how you crowd out the competition. I mean, it's as easy to type Google.com as it is to type Bing.com, right? There's a reason why Google outpaces Bing. Um, part of me thinks with this stuff is like, is a little bit, that's not the, this is not the part of me that I'm really proud of, right? You know, this is the part <laughs> of me that I'm kind of embarrassed about, but sometimes people have this. Like, I say to a lot of those companies, well, good, you know what, tough luck. You guys are all left wing. You all love big government, and this is what this is what you don't get. You can't get half big government. You can't get big government to regulate all sorts of things like fossil fuels and this and that and the other, and tell you where to go to school. And you can't get that, and then not have them look at you and say, "Well, wait a minute. While we're doing all this other regulation over here, we might want to regulate you." And I think there's a lot of people in Silicon Valley now who are suddenly rethinking. You know, they're zipping up their fleeces, their fleece vests, and thinking, "I wonder, <laughs> wonder if I've made a terrible mistake." Instead of being what they should have been all along, which is robust, uh, robust proponents of what got us here, risk capitalism. Like, you don't get, you know, you ask anybody in Silicon Valley, you don't win all the time. You win one, you know, it's like Hollywood. You win one-tenth of the time. But you got to play the game. You have to have, if you're an investor, you have chips on the, on, the, on the table, you have skin in the game. And if you're an entrepreneur, 
you've got to get in there swinging. And um, that's part of what we, uh, that's part of what makes America great. I always say that what makes America great isn't how many pe pe new people there are on those, you know, the Forbes 400 list or like whatever that is. <laughs> it's how many people drop off every year. Yeah, the that's, churn. The churn is that's healthy. That's what you want. New people at the top all the time. So you've been a conservative in Hollywood for a long time now. Um, yeah. Sad. And it developed over a period of time, uh, would you say? And, uh, but what about young people coming into your industry? Uh, oh, they're all liberals. They're all Democrats. Uh, and, and what if there was a conservative? Do they, do they see opportunity there? Are they well, discriminated against? Or? Well, you know, one of my old friends was a very close friend of mine, uh, Andrew Breitbart, who died, you know, 10 years ago now. Tell him, well, maybe more than that, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. No, 10 years ago. I think terrible. Um, he said, he would all, he, we would have this argument because he would say, yes, you know, there are a lot of people who feel like they haven't gotten jobs in Hollywood because somebody found out they were, you know, conservative. I have never experienced that. I never once experienced that. If anything, I found Hollywood to be a, kind of an open, interesting, truly embracing diversity community. I mean, compared to any American university, hmm. Hollywood is like this, you know, great free intellectual, you know, bazaar. Um, he hated that because he would say, well, that was my specific experience and it isn't real. And he would you know, have 10 or 15 other people he could say had the opposite experience. I write comedy. So I think that if you could tell what, who, what my politics are from, the, from my comedy, I'd be in trouble because there's nothing funny about politics. <laughs> there really isn't. Um, you know, Veep, very funny show on HBO. Uh, I don't really, I mean, I, I know they're all liberal, right? but you can't tell from watching that show. Um, but Silicon Valley, one of the funniest shows on TV, is pretty much a parody of what happens here in this valley. And I'm not sure, I, every now and then I see it, I think, oh, I think they're conservative. They're economic conservatives anyway. But in general, you don't really, you, if you want to tell funny stories, they have to be funny, and they have to be stories about people. And normal people don't think about politics that much. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, uh, I was watching a reboot of uh, One Day at a Time. Okay, right. And I was looking for uh, this kind of thing. Is, is it biased in some way, in a political way? Because if it was, it probably wouldn't be that funny. And I, I have to say they did kind of approach it in an even-handed way. Oh, really? Okay, um, I haven't seen it. Haven't seen surprisingly it. Uh, so. Well, look, I mean, I think that's a problem that I think, I think conservatives think too much about that in general. The, the generation that grew up watching Leave it to Beaver, right, which is, I have to explain this for people, like, it's a very, very middle-of-the-road 1950s sitcom in black and white. I think the parents were sleeping in twin beds. Like, it was that clean. <laughs> um, that generation that grew up watching that ended up rioting in the streets in the 60s. The generation that grew up in the 70s, early 70s, watching uh, Norman Lear sitcoms, which were you know, tumultuous and political and very left-wing and uh, they had a very clear political agenda of, of left-wing politics. They grew up to vote for Reagan. Hmm. So, you know, it's like, uh, the, the re uh, All in the Family is a great example. If you're old like me and you remember that show, that show was written by an incredibly outspoken liberal. It was written, in, uh, created by, written by all liberals. And they're all liberals on the, on the, on the screen. And it was supposed to be this, like, shaking conservative Americans on CBS, watching CBS sitcoms and saying, you know, the bit, there's a big world out there, and you guys need to, you know, and they used a, as an emblematic character, this character Archie Bunker, who was, like, conservative and probably and racist, and he was a bigot, and he was, like, reactionary, and he was exactly like every old white dude in 1970 who, like, couldn't believe what had happened to his country. And the American people watched that show, and they instantly realized, oh, Archie Bunker is the hero, because Archie Bunker was the only person on that show who had a job. His daughter had a job too. He and his daughter worked. His daughter worked to, to support his, you know, layabout son-in-law who was a graduate student studying some nonsense. Archie <laughs> Bunker worked two jobs. He worked on the docks and he worked. He, he, he drove a cab. And Americans looked at that and said, "Well, I don't know. Yeah, he's kind of a pain in the neck, but he." The guy's like, he's paying for the house, he's paying for the food, he's paying for everything you're doing. Show him a little respect. And I think it drove Norman Lear crazy because people, they naturally loved the guy who was, you know, earning.
so they somehow identified yeah. with, with him and, normal. and his family uh, dramas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like people watching TV, they want to relate to that character. They want to relate to somebody. And they're naturally going to relate to the guy. You know, they may not like it. They may not like everything. You know, they may not like everything he says. They may not agree with him politically. But they respect him as like a dude, as the head of the household, who's really, really working hard to put food on the table. And um, I think liberals had a hard time understanding that. So uh, you're going to be doing a presentation uh, yeah. at uh, the Liberty Forum, and uh, what kind of things will you be talking about? If you can get a little preview, of, a little preview, uh, sneak preview. Well, a um, I, my 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 concern right now is for for the the center right side that we are sort of lapsing into kind of this this kind of narcotized self narcotized sleep, where we're not paying attention. And where we prefer, and we we've, we've misunderstood one thing. We we we've misunderstood the success, the cultural or TV success of our heroes on TV, and we think that translate in, translates into political success. So there's a recent poll. Somebody asked the uh, conservative, self-described conservative Republicans to name, you know, the leaders of the Republican Party, okay. and they named Trump, which I think was good because he's the president. But the other four were all. Celebrities, they're all people on Fox News. Like talk show hosts. Talk show hosts. And that is a real problem because talk show hosts, even the really popular ones, even the ones that everybody loves on Fox News, they only get like 4 million, 5 million viewers, if, at, if that. And that's not enough. That's nothing. I mean, Jill Stein got more votes. I mean, Ralph Nader got more votes. So we have confused show business and politics in a way that I think is really going to hurt us, hurt the Republican Party in a major way in the future. So... What's the remedy to that? What do people need to be doing? Uh, well, you know, this is what, what, what all Republicans and conservatives hate. Do what the Democrats do. They're smart. They really are. Stop rolling your eyes and sneering at them. I know I, all my Republican friends like, like to make jokes about Nancy Pelosi like she's a moron. Nancy Pelosi was the Speaker of the House and then lost it, and she's the Speaker of the House again. That's hard. <laughs> uh, everybody makes fun of, like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Oh, she's great. She, yeah, sure, I disagree with her. But, you know, she put on a pair of sneakers, and she went door-to-door -door in a machine district, in a machine city, in a machine state, and she unseated a very entrenched, powerful Democratic incumbent. That's pretty good. That's pretty smart. Barack Obama, everybody says, oh, Barack Obama, he was the community, community organizer-in-chief. Like, oh, that's a ridiculous thing. That was smart. He won 53% of the vote. He got so many votes in 2008 that even when he lost a whole bunch of votes in 2012, he still won. That's like, he's like Mark Zuckerberg. If Mark Zuckerberg tomorrow loses $10 billion, he's still plenty rich. Don't worry about him. Like, we act like these people are dumb because we disagree with them instead of doing what we should be doing, which is what every winning football team does, which is you run film of your opponent to figure out what they do. Like, that's what the Patriots do before the Super Bowl, right? They sit and they don't watch themselves. They watch the other team to say, okay, well, we're going to be meeting that team on Sunday. They got there. So how do they get there? We don't do that. Instead, we would rather just sit there and watch Sean Hannity and applaud ourselves and say, oh, everything's fine. It's a mistake. So one of the plays of the, uh, the uh, we'll say the left side, uh, was to do ballot harvesting. Right? So this is one where I hear lots of uh, conservatives complaining, yeah. oh, this horrible practice, and it may be a horrible practice, uh, but um, the Democrats or liberals are doing this, and uh, the other side uh, was complaining about it. Um, and it looks like the conclusion would be, right, we need to do right. uh, as well as they do at it, or better, right. uh, better if we're going to win, right? If you want to win the presidency, not if you want to be a, uh, a best-selling author or a very popular talk show host or make a zillion dollars on Fox News, but if you want to win the presidency and want to win the country back, you're going to have to go door-to-door -door and knock on doors. You're going to have to engage with people who don't agree with you in neighborhoods where you don't think they're going to like you. You have to stop in front of the, every Subaru and say, can I just talk to you a little bit about capital gains? Uh, whatever it is, right? You have to engage with people. We don't want to do that. We just want to engage with each other. So the big fights in the, in the conservative movement are like, well, we don't like what Rachel Maddow said on MSNBC. Like, that matters. The, the, the actual scope of that issue is maybe 8, 000, 8 million people all in, like, from the right and the left. And the middle, the middle is just sit, sitting there waiting for somebody to pay attention to them. And trust me, in the middle, 
That's, that's who's getting the knocks on the doors from the Democrats. That is why the, the Democrats won the Dallas suburbs, the Dallas suburbs mm -hmm. in the midterms. That's why they won Orange County. Orange County. Because they are on the ground. We'd rather just sit there and tweet you know, obscenities at Rachel Maddow viewers and uh, watch Tucker Carlson, who I like. He's a great guy. He's very funny. But, you know, that's not going to move the needle. Well, uh, just changing, uh, changing topics slightly, uh, who's your favorite public conservative these days? Oh, God. That's a good uh, question. I don't really know. I mean... Or do you have one? <laughs> you know, I'm so... I'm so... Uh, Flinty and dark. I like. I you know. I, I was a. This is. I will already paint me in the, the probably the wrong light. But I, I love Mitch Daniels, former governor of Indiana. Mitch Daniels. Choice. He would go and he went. He, he went on knocked on doors. He liked to talk uh -huh. to people, and he let people talk to him, and he listened to them, and he pushed back when he disagreed. Very successful governor. Now he's president of Purdue, so he's a little happier in his life. Um, but there aren't that many. We don't, we don't have as many politicians who are really willing to, I think, really willing to, f uh, to engage with the people they need to engage with to actually get something done. And that, I mean, maybe Ben Sass. I like the senator from Nebraska, Ben Sass. He's a really smart guy, and he seems to, like, be trying to figure out how to, how to get the people that the Republican Party is losing, which is a lot of people, and how to get them back without changing the principles, mm -hmm. but just trying to reach out to them and say, you know, tell them a story about what he believes and why and see if they have a story about what they believe and why that's compatible, which is the only thing we can do to persuade people. Building those connections with people, yeah. uh, that's so important. Is there a last thought you'd like to leave us with as we wrap up uh, today? Oh, my gosh. I, I, I mean... Yeah. Just a minute. Left. I think my last thought would be this, is that we, we, you could also fall into the hole here and think, oh, God, everything's terrible. Like, oh, my God, the world is so awful. Like, Repub uh, conservatives do this too much. Like, everything, and, and liberals do it now, too. It's just the worst time ever, when, in fact, it's the greatest time ever in all of human history. We've never been richer, healthier, happier. We've never had more opportunities. In this country, we've never had more opportunities for all people. It's never been a better time, and all we do is sit there and whine and bitch and moan. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure having you. We appreciate you on the show today. Um, just as we go, the IFES Hall, 432 Stirland Road, Mountain View, is where the Liberty Forum meets. And in April, Robert Sirico, founder of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, is joining them. And in May, Mark Morano, who's a prominent global warming skeptic, founder and executive director of ClimateDepot.com, is the guest speaker. So please join them for more interesting views.